XOM in Chicago. And one of the great pleasures I have uh, in my role is I get to sit with our speakers for about an hour before the lectures. And uh, Scott was here uh, almost two years ago. We had a cabin meeting at Oak Ridge National Lab. And he presented something called the Earth Project. And uh, we, I, since then, we've had about a dozen lectures um, from various uh, partners and engineers at SOM. And at that time, I didn't know what to expect. So we really had a plan for, I guess it would be called, you could call it the health of the planet. And what I wondered in our conversation tonight was what kept him, uh, he's been at SOM for 20 years. So what keeps, keeps you interested for that long and allows you to do uh, research while you're working on everyday project? Right now, he manages eight to 10 projects. He was in Bangkok last week. He'll be in China next week. Uh, he's an administrator now. He, in addition to doing his architecture work, he runs teams. So uh, he's making change and uh, making lots of friends doing that. Uh, but I think what's really fascinating is that one of the things we were um, talking about for a second was, and this is important for all of you, that you're all being educated to be architects and designers and landscape architects. But I think you have to have another dimension another creative dimension that keeps you going beyond the office. So one of the things that uh, Scott was, and I were talking about was that what attracted, attracted him to SOM, and it still attracts him, is the ability to do research and do innovative, uh, pushing the envelope kind of work. And uh, one, when we were having our conversation, I said, you know, when I grew up, my mom had a poetry book, and we didn't have a lot of books like that, and I would take it down once in a while and try to read one of the poems, and it was by William Carlos Williams. Do you know who that is? He's a famous American poet. But uh, the interesting thing was that wasn't his job. He wasn't a poet. He was a pediatrician. He was the head of pediatrics in a hospital uh, in the county that I grew up in. And I, what, I, what I really think that um, you need to think about tonight is how an architect can start to have an intellectual life beyond the pragmatics of their everyday work. So, you know, I was in a review today, and the students are well on their way toward that. But uh, I think you're going to find this lecture incredibly interesting tonight. The lecture, by the way, that uh, Scott gave at Oak Ridge He'd al he's also given to the UN and to the city uh, council in New York City, uh, advising them on geothermal and uh, uh, in high-rise towers. Uh, Scott's a graduate of uh, Lehigh University, and he has his Master of uh, Architecture degree from Harvard. And he's, been, he's taught at Columbia. And as I said earlier, he's presently run, uh, running eight to 10 projects at SOM in Chicago. He was in New York when he was here last time. He's in Chicago now where Phil can get a hold of him and say, hey, Scott, you want to give a lecture at Knoxville? And he can't say no. So we're, pl we're really pleased to have you tonight, and I'm looking forward to your lecture. Well, thanks, Scott. Thank you. Can everyone hear me OK? How's the audio? It's good. So. Scott, you make it sound so sort of jam-packed and, and impressive, uh, which is not how it feels on a day-to-day -day basis. But you raise a, a good point, uh, I think, about the need to uh, balance um, practice and intellectual inquiry. And frankly, that's uh, why I've been with the firm for 20 years, uh, since I was a summer intern to now um, as of last year, design partner. Uh, I want to thank the uh, School of Architecture and Design for having me here and the Governor's Chair Program, which is um, in part uh, 
why you may see so much participation from SOM with uh, the school here uh, because of this ongoing collaboration. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Scott for inviting me. And um, on the issue of uh, sort of balancing the intellectual with the practical, uh, it's a great opportunity to come uh, talk to you all uh, tonight uh, because it's, it's a time to try to establish some context for the work that we're doing uh, and g uh, give some perspective on that as well. Uh, we're very busy on multiple projects and it's important to step back and take stock of all of that. So um, by no means is today's talk a conclusion. It's, it's a journey. It's uh, definitely not a destination, but um, I wanted to share some reflections about uh, where uh, architecture has come from, uh, the influences that uh, I see from where I sit on, uh, on the architectural production of today, uh, and maybe speculate a little bit together with you, and I'm happy to take uh, questions about where that might go uh, from here. So um, this is only uh, for uh, Scott Poole's benefit as a, as a um, fan of Finnish architecture. Uh, but uh, this is the Paimio Sanatorium roof deck. So you, pr you should remember from your architectural history class uh, this very important building um, designed by Alvaro Alto, in, uh, completed in 1933. Um, so I'll talk about this building, but before I do, want to establish a little bit of the um, kind of intellectual framework for uh, the architectural avant-garde of the time uh, with a quote. The new house is a prefabricated unit for site assembly and as such an industrial product and a work of specialists, economists, st statisticians, hygienists, climatologists, industrial engineers, standards experts, heat engineers, and the architect, he was an artist and has become a specialist in organization. Uh, so this is Hannes Meyer, 1928. He uh, was kicked out of the Bauhaus ba basically for being too radical and adopting an overly functionalist point of view. He was a sort of extreme functionalist. Uh, but there was a high degree of optimism for architecture at the time when modernism was emerging, that this was indicative of new ways of thinking about uh, uh, sort of social relationships and uh, technology, mass production, etc. cetera. To, for Alto, the, um, and I'm just gonna read a little bit here too as well, um, on the, on the sanatorium, his starting point for the design was to make the building itself a contributor to the healing process. He liked to call the building a, quote, medical instrument. For instance, particular attention was paid to the design of the patient bedrooms. These generally held two patients, each with his or her own cupboard and wash basin. Alto designed special silent basins so that the patient would not disturb the other while washing. Alto placed the lamps in the room out of the patient's line of vision and painted the ceiling a relaxing grayish green so as to avoid glare. Each patient had their own specially designed cupboard fixed to the wall and off the floor so as to aid in cleaning beneath it. So you can see um, perhaps the, the design to your eyes does not appear radical, but the thinking behind it because you've become so accustomed to it. But the thinking behind it was really um, embracing the kind of technological, positivist, um, you know, highly scientific approach to design at the time. So um, starting, w I'll talk about bubbles and, and sponges on this kind of journey here, but um, Mies Bubble with his uh, concept of universal space uh, was a, an aggrandizement of 
the industrial age. Uh, so that went to the details, it went to the aesthetic, and it was deliberately aesthetic. Uh, these buildings almost always had no air conditioning. So they were true kind of glass bubbles. The, uh, the connection with, with nature was often a visual one. Um, but I love the, the platform, the kind of arrival. Uh, it's, it's visible next to the uh, enclosed part of the guest house at the Farnsworth house. Um, but it's, it's almost, it's reaching out into the landscape. It's sort of, uh, you know, yearning for a connection to the landscape around it. There were practice sort of counterparts of, um, of Mies uh, in the form of Oscar Niemeyer, who uh, in his own house literally was uh, adopting natural forms. And uh, I love this photograph uh, where he's there in the foreground, probably his wife, uh, where the stone is sort of crashing through the glass bubble, if you will, of the modernist house. And I don't know if those plants are going to survive or they, they kind of look like they're dying in there, but there's a, there's a, a desire to really blur uh, the natural with the interior space uh, of, the, um, the, of the house itself. Um, so this, this modern idiom of the industrial is being blurred with the natural uh, in a very explicit way. I mean, in the, pre in the previous uh, image, you see the, the giant boulder is as much a part of the composition as any of the architectural design uh, itself. So my firm, SOM, was founded in 1936, so is inextricably linked with the history of modernism. Uh, it's been responsible for some of the most, uh, many, many important modern buildings uh, over time, one of which um, is Lever House in New York City, which um, many people don't know was completed a couple of years before the Seagram building was, uh, just across the street from, uh, from Seagram. Uh, it, again, because we've become so accustomed, I think, to seeing modern buildings, um, we, this may seem normative to our eyes today. But at the time it was built, it was about radically transforming and rethinking the uh, urban diagram. You know, New York is this perimeter block uh, uh, set of canyons. Lever House turned that inside out and created these floating glass volumes within. Just to give you a sense of um, a, a sort of time context, look at the cars in the foreground, right? So, you know, you, you understand that this was like a UFO dropped on um, Park Avenue. It was a bubble, it was all glass, but it had some spongy parts too. So, um, I, in talking today, I, I won't focus only on this, the, whether a building is a bubble or a sponge, because often they come uh, somewhere in between. This is the roof deck, which you see has a courtyard. And uh, while the headquarters functions were in the office uh, block above, the um, collective sort of recreation cafeteria functions were in the uh, podium and on the roof deck here, in connection with na nature. Uh, Lever House is credited with um, the invention of the curtain wall, the glass curtain wall, which I think led a lot to um, uh, this phenomenon of the bubble that was about an absolute sort of definitive hermetic separation between you and uh, the environment uh, on the outside. Uh, you can see there are no, there are no operable windows here. It, it's uh, an idea that we can dominate and control the environment around us through technology, right? Through air conditioning, through lighting, all of that. Uh, and the promise of technology, we can overcome what's around us. And I think, um, you know, if you take nothing else away from today's lecture, it's that we can't do that anymore. I think we need to have buildings that are much more interactive with um, their environments. 
So another SOM example, uh, it, this is a floating bubble, maybe part a sponge, but um, a, uh, a headquarters building for an ad agency. This is quite literally where um, a company like Mad Men would have their operation. This was a, a, an advertising company. People were terrified of the city. They were headed out to the suburbs. And so you get the modern office park as a, uh, a consequence of that. This is out in the rolling hills of Connecticut. It's a very beautiful site. And the, the building is a wafer floating above the uh, surrounding landscape. You can see the entire building is held up on Pilo T, but they're very expressive Pilo T. Um, one thing that's important to our firm is our engineering history. Skidmore and Owings were architects. Merrill was an engineer. So there was, there's always this idea of uh, the engineering dimension or technological innovation being part of the story. And uh, you know, in the case of, uh, of a building like this, we see structural innovation, kind of almost tree-like elements supporting the building. And all the cars, remember this is uh, in the suburbs as the suburbs are growing, are parked underneath. So it's a diagram of kind of work floating above the um, surrounding context. And it's very much floating, right? It's, it's, it is hermetic. It's, uh, it's up above the landscape sort of you know, looking out over it, very bucolic setting. But the interior is, uh, right, could be a scene out of Mad Men. It's this sort of highly repetitive, um, you know, very disciplined uh, interior structure. And I, and I want to say that um, this was a very important moment in American history. Uh, it was uh, an important part of uh, our uh, culture as it exists today. Um, so I'm not looking to judge it. I'm looking to sort of give some observations about it. Uh, the windows, once again, not operable, right? It's, it's, um, it's quite literally a bubble, uh, fluorescent light fixtures, which were really state of the art at the time, uh, take care of all the lighting needs that, were, um, that one might have. Um, the cafeteria below, Again, sits at the ground level, but is isolated from the ground plane around. Uh, and this is why I said it's kind of spongy, is that there's a, there was a um, garden space at the center. The building's kind of a donut. And the, um, so there was a, a landscaped area that was mainly a kind of visual, um, uh, let's say, presence of lands, landscape and the, and the exterior. Another example from... Uh, SOM's own history, um, calling it the stone bubble. So the Beinecke Rare Book Library at Yale University uh, was also a radical addition to the Yale campus at the time it was done. The Yale campus is a Gothic style campus and this was obviously not a Gothic building, although it took on many of the same sort of materials and structural logics and expression that we see in, um, in Gothic architecture. Uh, we, the, the building appears very massive from the outside and that's because it's all made of stone. Uh, the interior uh, reveals the fact that the stone is actually thin enough to allow light through, uh, which gives a kind of soft uh, filtered light and warm uh, glow to the interior of the reading room. Again, this is a rare book library. Uh, within that outer stone bubble is another bubble, which is the uh, rare book, climate controlled rare book <coughs> stack itself. So it's sort of glass set within stone and the reading room happens in between. Uh, so the books are protected by light and um, uh, and, and this new reading room is created. It's still there, it's worth a visit. So a mediated bubble, um, one more example from, uh, from SOM's history is the Armstrong Cork headquarters. Uh, and you can see the, the obvious derivation of the language from Mies van der Rohe, right? We, you see all of those component parts and express structure and high degree of modularity and so on. And I, I call it um, a mediated bubble because the facade is actually starting to acquire thickness to it. And you see there's a, 
a line of glass, the vertical, that's shown there, but then the slab edges protrude the, um, it's, it's an entirely um, free span interior space, so the truss work that supports that roof is um, cantilevering beyond. And uh, it's at, you know, at, at SOM at the time, the opportunity for uh, all of the engineers and architects to be collaborating in a very direct way because it's hard to separate any aspect of the structure, let's say, for how it's expressed on the exterior. In that very thin vertical line that you saw of the, gla of the glazing, there are a series of layers of uh, sliding sunshades. Uh, you see uh, the rigid insulation pointed out, the radiator, thin tube radiator, uh, integrated in that same thin sandwich, uh, and the acoustic tile pointed to, which was really cutting edge, edge technology at the time. We, we've sort of come to understand it as ubiquitous, but at the time, this was a triumph of uh, controlling the environment, of uh, using technology and products to, that, that were newly available uh, to make a better work environment, and could be seen as an early, a kind of precursor of sustainability. Right, where the sun shading, uh, the deep overhangs, the integration of the mechanical system in the facade are, okay, perhaps naive, but really trying to understand uh, and explore the importance of mitigating the environment, the environmental um, factors from outside. Uh, Skidmore, Ongs, and Merrill is an architecture, engineering, planning, interior design, product design, uh, firm. We kind of do everything. So a building like this would be, um, have all of its furniture uh, designed together with, uh, you know, a single team sitting around the table. The lighting, uh, you can see these kind of coffers in there. So, and, and this happens to show the uh, slide, the, the uh, blinds kind of slid uh, closed to um, still allow view, but filter the light out. Uh, so we start to see the kind of the modernist um, pavilion open up and and uh, gain nuance within its skin. So I'm I'm going to jump way ahead, but wanted to, in in time, but wanted to talk about um, I think an important detail about uh, our firm's history, which is um, that. Nat Owings, who was the Owings of Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, uh, at the end of his career wrote this book uh, and spent the final decade of his life uh, trying to save the environment on the coast of California. Uh, this book, The American Aesthetic, was very was clairvoyant and uh, foresaw many of the uh, problems that came with urbanization and exploitation of the environment. Uh, and he really laid out strategies in the book about how to remediate that. And his focus was in the U.S. And he uh, got very involved with politics and activism. Uh, here was a guy who had built dozens of towers, uh, dozens of corporate headquarters, and he um, really came to a realization that our buildings needed to be more responsive to the environment. Uh, and that was um, sort of not a sentiment that wasn't unique to uh, Owings. It was something that was um, in the air. And I wanted to point out a real outlier here. People like Paolo Soleri, he does not do bubbles. You know, there were people that were thinking about how architecture could be more synthetic with nature. Uh, this is one of many projects that he did, and you can see the obvious uh, likeness to a root or to a tree. And um, for those of you who, who don't know, he planned this utopian community in the uh, hills outside of Flagstaff, Arizona, Arcosanti, which was to be a kind of commune uh, with architecture that had this very organic character to it. 
uh, and it's partially realized. You can go visit, visit it. It's interesting. It's kind of creepy, but very interesting and, uh, you know, a, a, a real artifact. Um, but, you know, there were people in the 60s and the 70s who were jumping up and down trying to convince people that this was, uh, that, that respect for the environment was an important uh, factor in our buildings. Um, and, okay, Paolo Soleri was a bit of a marginal character, but, uh, but he was kind of right about a lot of it. Um, this, you may know, is uh, one of uh, Charles Jenks' evolutionary trees, which um, many people uh, laugh at. Um, Jenks is a brilliant uh, historian, uh, but he has a very kind of poppy, uh, often uh, populist point of view about how to describe the value of architecture. And he does these maps of architectural history, which I think are important to review uh, periodically to think about, again, as I think Scott said at the beginning, you know, where, where are you in this whole map of, of uh, a kind of epistemological framework? You know, what do you stand for? How do you fit into it? And he updates these over time. What's interesting, among other things here is, and the, the kind of horizontal axis is time, right? So from uh, 1900 to 2000, and a lot of it is very stream of consciousness, but you can sort of pick out, uh, you know, we see Liebeskind and Coolhouse and, uh, you know, things that are more esoteric, the Aga Khan Awards, et cetera. Um, and SOM appears twice in this map of uh, sort of architectural history. I want to be, have, have the third appearance of SOM uh, in the next version that Jenks does, but uh, that's an ongoing project. I think you see Mies in the first instance uh, right next to SOM. We're closely associated with um, his history. And then a kind of strain that moves from classical revivalism to corporate modernism or maybe up to postmodern. So it's a sort of choose your own adventure of um, architectural history. Uh, and I think the point is that these ideas um, don't come out of, of nowhere. They have precedent. So fast forward to, to today, I'd like to share some of the uh, projects that we've been doing uh, over the last 15 years or so. Um, the first uh, is definitely a sponge, and it's in uh, a forested setting, or it was. Um, uh, this is the site, and uh, it's in the hills of Connecticut. Um, not an old, old growth forest, but a, a second growth forest, so a former field that um, had trees sort of growing up within it. And the first thing I noticed when coming to the site was how beautiful and high that tree canopy was that there were these slender uh, trunks of, the, of the, uh, the trees and then this filter, filtering kind of green canopy up above. Um, and the program that for the building that we were designing there is a school. So we thought about how to take a typical diagram or what might be considered to be a typical diagram of a school, double loaded corridor, you have the gym and the cafeteria or other shared functions at the ends. Um, and and modify it, pull, pull that, those classrooms apart. Uh, those are the boxes on the top and the bottom there, individual classrooms. Put the shared functions in the center and bring nature into the plan uh, as a series of courtyards. So uh, study model here showing the overall building form and the interior where the guts are this sort of mixing uh, bowl, if you will, of uh, programmatic elements and um, courtyards within. This is the building um, as it's built. I, I should say that the original uh, geometry of the courtyards was derived from uh, existing tree locations. So the idea is that the, the building would be built around some of these very beautiful uh, mature trees on the site. Uh, I came to the site one day. Uh, the trees had been removed. The contractor was smirking. Uh, they said it was too complex and convinced the owner to remove them. They paid the $10,000 penalty per tree that we had put into our specs. So um, my, 
I lost a bit of my soul that, that day, uh, but it was still, um, you know, a, a great project and experience. So our trees are quite, uh, uh, they're probably taller now, but are, are not quite what uh, we had intended. But you can see this uh, blurring of the interior and the exterior spaces um, throughout, whether it's at the entry uh, or, in this case, a courtyard that is adjacent to a, a science and technology room where the courtyard becomes a place where blueberries are grown and a weather station exists and their kids are looking at butterflies and so on. So a deliberate sort of transposition of the natural together with the, the interior. Um, and, you know, I've been back to the school since it's, since it's opened and um, the, the kids can immediately engage, obviously, with the um, concept of the school. Their, their day-to-day ex experiences like this, going from one class to the other, going to the music room or the, the library and so on. That happens to be the library to the right. Uh, we, uh, the, the building is made of very humble materials. It's actually split face block and curtain wall. Uh, but we did something to relate to the filtered light through that tree canopy um, that I was describing before in putting small windows that uh, correspond to the uh, CMU, concrete masonry unit, module in the wall in a kind of uh, playful pattern that evoked that, um, that filtered light. Uh, there, were, there were also uh, field stones that were on the site where the building was uh, being excavated that were saved and turned into uh, a bench at the front door. So when you walk in the school, you have, you know, before you go to see the the faculty or teachers, you um, you or the kids sit at the, this uh, bench. So the next project um, I can describe as the cloud. Uh, so this is a um, project for an airport uh, in Singapore, uh, which was a competition. And um, I know it seems like I'm an old guy, but uh, back in the day, I was a super user of the computer. I wrote the script uh, for that array of uh, 215,000 uh, sun shading panels that fit onto this kind of uh, Miesian uh, structural grid and system below as a pavilion. Uh, each panel was uh, rotated at a random angle and the which sounds easy for all of you grasshopper people, but with Max Script and Basic at the time, which is what I had, it was um, it was a major challenge. Uh, but what that means is we had a um, a roof that functioned very much like a cloud. Uh, and in Singapore, where it's very hot in the tropics, the cloud is actually a welcome uh, addition to the day because it provides shade and relief. So that topmost surface, that cloud, uh, has um, a roof deck with multiple openings, apertures within it. Uh, and the, the building then has that framework with, uh, with the um, array of uh, panels sort of sandwiching it, both above and below, as a way of uh, mitigating the intense sun that's in there. Uh, each Skylight has an operable panel on it. So uh, as the sun is mov moving through the sky over the course of the day, the, um, we called it a butterfly, a pair of these panels uh, open or closed to, to um, kind of gauge the amount of light that's able to come into the, uh, into the airport. Um, and when I went there for the first time when the building was under construction, it was fascinating because we had these uh, green walls that create an important threshold as, as people are leaving this, the country. Um, the workers had opened up all of the skylights that were right above the green area and were using, using that to grow the green wall that was there. Uh, so they were kind of using the, the roof as a, as a device, a kind of, albeit an artificial one, to um, you know, allow for uh, things to grow on the inside. So just a couple of more views. Uh, an important aspect of the design that we were developing as this, um, uh, as we were developing the architecture was the daylight level that would uh, result in 
the highest degree of alertness and gen general health of the employees within the uh, terminal. You know, people are there for a long time. It's a 100% daylit terminal during the day. Uh, and this was, I think, you know, roughly 10 years ago. Uh, but we were looking at, um, at that time, how uh, daylight affects your health uh, and teamed up with scientists to, um, to basically drive this uh, roof as a, uh, um, as a way of increasing the comfort and productivity of people in there. So the next project is a very horizontal sponge, uh, which is uh, out in the desert uh, between Kuwait and Iraq. Uh, I was there uh, right around 2002, which um, was post 9-11, very um, sort of uncertain time for that part of uh, the world. And the program for this building uh, is essentially the West Point of Kuwait. It's the military officer's uh, university for, uh, for, for the state of Kuwait. Um, so we, we approach the problem, and it's a very harsh environment, as you might imagine. It's quite literally out in the desert. Uh, so one of the major concerns was sandstorms uh, because uh, as a secure sort of complex out in the desert, um, the idea of having drifting sand come and basically create a way that anybody could come over a boundary wall and walk right into your campus would, would not be a good idea, right? Um, not to mention the discomfort of it. So uh, we developed these shelter belts that are um, shrubs, uh, grasses, trees, that uh, are focused on the upwind direction uh, where all of the sandstorms come from so that the soil is held in place upwind of the complex itself. The uh, concept for uh, the architecture was derived uh, around a series of courtyards because courtyards are a very um, effective way of shading. This is a, a diagram of the um, resulting uh, sun shading. Uh, and also protect from wind. So it was both a kind of solar consideration and a wind consideration. Uh, the functional diagram of the campus was very tightly prescribed by the leadership there. Uh, and just, you know, we're talking about buildings like um, classroom buildings, but also dormitories and a medical clinic and a uh, administration set of buildings, an auditorium, these kinds of things. Uh, and one of the uh, you, probably unique aspects of it being a military institution is, is you know exactly where the cadets are at any point in the day. They have a very kind of fixed schedule that is, um, you know, it being the military, highly prescribed. So we used the abundant resource of the sun uh, to basically you, to allow light into areas of the campus where the cadets would be at, at specifically the time that they would be there. So it took a lot of uh, work with the, figuring out the geometry and sun path, but um, if diagrammatically you see this small hole at the center of both diagrams as an aperture in the, in the roof surface, you can derive a shape below it that will control exactly when the sun is allowed to pass through it uh, at, for any time of day throughout the year. So if you want the dot to arrive at 2 p.m. every day, you can derive that. Um, so this is, the, they're peculiar shapes, but this is indicative of the kind of coffered appearance of what the underside of one of those uh, roof decks might be. And each one of these has a different time uh, period associated with it. Each one of the shapes, you can see this is a typical courtyard within. Uh, the shapes at the edge of the canopy to the interior of the canopy all correspond to different times when the cadet would come or go from that particular courtyard. It kind of holds together as an overall array 
uh, the building facades were um, derived to uh, accept the daylight in, but then create the maximum reflection of uh, direct light um, uh, without, or sorry, ma maximum reflected light with the minimum direct light. So there were a series of genetic algorithms that we went through to determine from different orientations how we could do that, and they resulted in shapes like this that uh, populate the campus. So east-facing facades look one way, west-facing fa look a, a different, north and south are different. And this is the building. I grabbed this off of Google Earth. This is the complex under construction um, as of the latest from Google Earth. And you can kind of see um, some of the courtyard shapes emerging uh, if, you, if you squint. Uh, the next project uh, I call the Sponge Cube. So uh, this was same country in Kuwait. We were designing the university and a um, uh, media tech, so uh, library and um, information technology center, starting with the concept of the cube, uh, which we then uh, passed pedestrian paths through at the, ca at the ground floor kind of campus level, uh, penetrated with a series of atria uh, that are connected to skylights, and then distributed uh, these collaboration spaces, reading rooms, uh, and meeting rooms around the perimeter, uh, which results in the overall building form. That form is then uh, shrouded in a series of sunshades. The building is a combination of uh, glazing and uh, opaque um, areas, um, the interior of which have this kind of filtered light quality and contain a series of inter interpenetrating voids here you see where the Department of Information Technology has views down via a vertical um, penetration into the book stacks. Um, so there are a lot of conditions on the interior where one, uh, one group, one faculty is um, g getting views into the activities of the other discipline, let's say. I mean, not unlike probably what happens in your atrium here where you get a sense of what's happening with the other departments. Uh, even though you may not be working with them. Uh, and that extends to the circulation uh, and to the ground level where certain aspects, certain um, areas are open 24 hours, others are closed, uh, and to the perimeter where there are, there's a kind of microclimate zone between that outer shading element and the inner volume of the building uh, where uh, one is protected from the sun and the elements, and we include uh, water and more plantings, vegetation, um, to, to change the kind of perception of what is very, a very, very hot environment of, of Kuwait. Uh, we move to a vertical sponge uh, and take some inspiration from the local vernacular of, uh, this is Saudi Arabia. Uh, so um, the vernacular of the region uh, is uh, in many areas derived from courtyards for the climatic reasons that I described before. This is an aerial view of a medina or city, uh, which is essentially a set of buildings set very closely to each other, uh, but with interior courtyards that really become the main uh, spaces of a house or a building uh, within. So that's the medina. Uh, for our project, which is a um, mixed use residence and office building with retail, uh, we turn that uh, diagram vertically, uh, so the, um, because of the site constraints, we had a very linear site. We wanted to create that kind of variegated urbanism uh, and utilize shaded spaces, but uh, could only do it in a vertical way. So it became this array of uh, volumes interspersed with voids. The floor plans uh, are kind of surprising, very porous. Uh, they have, um, uh, I'm not sure I would recommend doing this again, but having n no unit is identical. Uh, each unit is unique uh, within, the, within the building. So my, my apartment is not like yours. You can see from the left uh, diagram how that uh, sort of variation is achieved. Uh, if we go hypothetically from a low point in the building moving upward, you can see the transformations that occur and the degree of sometimes the corridor becomes a, an entirely interior space. Sometimes it's 
an entirely exterior space. That gray connector is literally passing through one of those vertical courtyards. Each unit has a um, high degree of exterior space. So where the umbrella is shown uh, and the lounge chairs are shown, there's a horizontal line below. That's the line of glass. So the interior space and the exterior space kind of become uh, blurred. And um, it was important, given the intensity of the weather in Saudi, that um, those areas be protected. So they, there are these deep set kind of balconies that result so that your, um, you do have outdoor space, but it's protected from the direct sun. Uh, and this I grabbed off somebody's Instagram feed of, it must have been a construction worker or something, snapping a picture uh, of it from an adjacent building. And you can see it kind of um, under construction in context. And this is um, the more uh, highly developed or cl closer to completion version um, using stone, um, local materials, and glass um, kind of creeping si uh, skyward. So uh, from that vertical sponge to a very vertical sponge, um, now we go to Beijing, where uh, we're working with uh, essentially a uh, typical office building. Uh, so a series of repeated floor plates, very efficient, very rational. And our concept was to intersperse public space or communal space within that vertical, uh, very repeated matrix, let's say. So the section looks something like this, and uh, the client liked the idea that each, um, each zone within the building, the light blue being regular floor plates and the dark blue being the, uh, the atrium, uh, could be uh, thought of as an individual neighborhood, might be one, one business in one zone, another business in another, uh, and the meeting space kind of happening in between. So this is the building. Um, on the skyline, it's right, CCTV is just down the street um, from this. And you can see, I'll just pivot back a second, the um, location of the atria sort of floating within this structural framework within. So this is what it might be like in one of those uh, upper level sky gardens that, um, that give on to the office spaces to the right and the elevator core and then looking out over uh, Beijing. So this is almost like a, a building that one might find out in uh, the periphery of the city, but uh, translated upward into the sky in downtown uh, Beijing. Another view, um, I think you see CCTV off in the distance uh, there, the kind of gridded form, and our um, atria uh, along the, the, the face that faces the corner. This is the building under construction as of, I think, uh, a couple of weeks back. And you see in the overall structure uh, the kind of regular office floor plates and then these interruptions, the atria kind of crisscrossing back and forth uh, across the building massing. Uh, so I think this is uh, the last building that I'll talk about. It's, it's sometimes a bubble and sometimes a sponge. Uh, as I said, there's not often a clear uh, distinction between the two, uh, but we go back to uh, Saudi Arabia, to Riyadh, where um, we're asked to design a, a conference center uh, and um, adopt a strategy of building the building into the landscape. So uh, you can see that in the aerial view here, uh, it's very difficult to, um, de to determine where the building starts and the landscape ends, uh, and that was, um, deliberate and part of uh, the overall site planning strategy. Uh, the climate is a major consideration for the design in, in Saudi. So our landscape form, notionally represented here as the kind of three peaks, um, was built up and then seen as a, mitig a kind of mitigating layer, not unlike the, the um, airport, but in a different way, uh, that would allow for comfortable spaces beneath it. Uh, so it serves as something that is both protecting, but also um, um, uh, allowing for a connection with the elements around. So just with a few more detail, it's a conference center. So the, the key function is 
really large meeting areas, some auditoriums, some, some multifunction halls, some uh, conference areas. Um, the, the demand is such that the spaces like this one, where people spend a lot of time uh, seated or uh, you know, participating in events, uh, need to be fully cooled um, through uh, mechanical means. But that space in between that, uh, that roofscape and the, the boxes, these air-conditioned meeting spaces within, has less of a demand for uh, cooling. And while it gets extremely hot in Saudi uh, during some times of the year, other times it's very pleasant. It's like, you know, Florida. Um, and so you, you do want to have the bubble moment and you want the sponge moment. You want to be able to allow uh, the, the climate in. So that buffer zone that's shown there is the intermediate sort of circulation zone between the functional uh, spaces within. Um, we did the perhaps counterintuitive thing of uh, utilizing the, the heat of the sun uh, to drive convection within the building envelope itself. So that outer kind of faceted profile is the roofscape. And um, we located a, a series of panels beneath that level that's shown in a horizontal line uh, that are actually allowed to heat up by having the sun pass completely through clear glass to them. By heating up, it starts convection in that buffer zone, that space in between, and creates a kind of natural breeze within that space uh, in between the functional areas. So this is just a detail of kind of conceptually how that works, where the outer layer is glass, the um, inner layer heats up, and the air passes through dampers uh, in that upper roof surface. This is an interior view of that upper roof surface. And um, at the peaks, w w they're not visible in this uh, particular view, but at the peaks, which is where all the heat rises to, is where those absorption panels um, open. Uh, sand was a big concern uh, because they're just like Kuwait. Uh, in Saudi, many concerns about sandstorms. Uh, so there, there is an interlock for those dampers that open up that sense um, when a sandstorm is approaching. It gets climate data from the weather, National Weather Service and closes the dampers down so the sand doesn't enter the building. And then within those, as I called them, air-conditioned boxes, those function meeting rooms um, are kind of nestled into the forest and incorporate the forest being the sort of canopy of um, the, the, that over, overrides everything, um, and uh, have a series of green walls that um, are uh, allowed to grow through uh, the natural daylight that comes through those spaces. So this is the exterior of the building. You see the kind of blurring of the landscape and, and the building form itself. And this is it during construction. You can see at the center um, some the kind of grayish area of the transparent uh, glass panels uh, where there's no pixelated pattern on it. That's one of those solar absorption uh, zones. Uh, I should talk about the, the skin itself was meant to be um, a filter and uh, incorporate planting within it. Uh, it's in, a, in an arid climate like Saudi Arabia's, it's very hard to, uh, to um, grow plants in, in the conventional sense. Uh, but we identified some uh, local species that had very low water requirements uh, and developed a pallet system. And an so this is a section through one of those panels uh, where irrigation and drainage are uh, integrated within that. Uh, we had planned for the panels within those triangles to be a um, man-made growth medium, uh, which simulates uh, tufa, which is basically a limestone, um, uh, crumbled limestone uh, geological formation that uh, exists throughout Saudi, holds water, and allows plant roots to take, uh, to take root within that. Um, 
We beta tested it with the local university. The client got nervous, decided not to uh, implement it. Uh, and um, well, stay tuned because I'll come back to what, what happened. Uh, in thinking of the patterning of the facade, there was, and so the, the enclosure, um, there was an analysis done of the solar radiation on the surfaces of the, uh, of the roof to see where the intensity was least and greatest. Uh, in this case, the um, red and yellow indicate areas of high degree of uh, solar radiation. And then through Grasshopper, thank you, we finally had Grasshopper when we were doing this, uh, we assigned the densities of, um, of opaque panels to correspond to those areas of highest degree of solar intensity. So basically, you block more light where there's more uh, sun coming in and plant out those panels. So this is a, a more recent picture with um, the plant material starting to come in. As I said, the, the client um, kind of got nervous about this science experiment that we had created, about you know creating this hyper tufa, as we called it, this growth medium, and got uh, Patrick Blanc, the, the French um, designer who is responsible for many green walls around the world. You may have heard him speak or seen his work uh, to design the plantings, which you see, um, I think, interestingly, with scale uh, here uh, under construction. And then on the interior, this is a photograph uh, showing those green walls uh, having been implemented. Uh, and the majority of the growth happens through uh, the daylight. There's such an abundance of daylight that it allows for the plants to grow. But there are also LEDs that are integrated with the edges of each one of those planters so that um, in seasons where there's not enough daylight, the uh, LEDs can compensate and help the, uh, the plants to grow. Interestingly, along the way, we learned a whole bunch of facts about making plants grow, one of which was that um, red light actually is favorable for plants growing. So the, li the lights at night will, I haven't seen it yet, but will uh, be glowing red. So um, we're, as I said, this is a, a process and not a conclusion, um, but I wanted to pose maybe an observation or a question here about the age of the microbe. So uh, Luke Leong, who's my colleague and the director of our sustainable engineering group, has been researching the positive health benefits of having microbial diversity in our buildings, essentially saying that some amount of dirt may be good for, uh, for you and for, for your health. Um, so he cites examples of children growing up on farms, having reduced instances of asthma and other chronic diseases. Uh, so in our studios and with Luke, we're exploring ways that more microbes, more organisms, more nature uh, can be introduced into our building designs. So uh, you see this could be maybe with bad details, but a, the, the kind of Miesian modern condition of a primarily visual connection between, uh, in this case, man and nature or a gorilla at the zoo. Um, and Animals don't do well in zoos often because they don't have the proper degree of, um, of freedom and connection to, uh, to nature. But I thought it was an interesting parallel with the kind of very, if you think of the sanatorium, a very hygienic view of what buildings can be uh, and maybe a growing realization that uh, our buildings don't want to be so hermetic uh, in nature, don't want to be so... Um, uh, free of things even like dirt. Dirt might be good for us. Um, I found uh, this diagram of uh, old growth forest in the United States from 1620 to 1990. So in, dar in the dark, in black, you see uh, essentially the untouched forests uh, of the country when uh, the first settlers were arriving. Uh, and then over time, as an 1850 is an important kind of era, if you think about uh, the, the Industrial Revolution and how we were really starting to um, uh, become extremely powerful through our use of machines. Uh, look at the gap from 1850 to 
1926 and then to 1990. I think upstate New York and a few spots in um, Montana are left, but other than that, not, um, not much. And this is um, indicative of this domination of nature philosophy that modernism grew up under. Uh, and there was, some, there was a lot of faith in the um, promise of industry and the industrial age. I don't want to cast dispersions on it because we were doing the best we possibly could at that time. Um, but I think something for you all to consider as you become architects is uh, perhaps that you could view the natural world um, less as functional, uh, as a series of uh, sort of unlimited resources, but so, um, something that uh, we may want to actually allow wild nature to come into. This is a diagram in green of um, agricultural land and brown of uh, pasture. So there's a, a kind of a relationship between the previous set of slides where you see the, the forests going away and the emergence of mechanized agriculture. Uh, and we have ideas about how to maybe better use this land that I can talk about a different time uh, to achieve some of these goals of, net, of letting nature in. Uh, but I'm hoping that our architecture can be maybe less like the bubble and more like the sponge. Thank you. Good. Yeah, I, d I don't think we're at a point where we can just let it go. We, we have to be active participants in creating the ecosystems and fixing the ecosystems. So if you've heard Phil Enquist, my partner, talk about his project on the Great Lakes, where he's, he's looking at how to restore entire ecosystems like that, it has to be done in an active way. Uh, but uh, agriculture is a particular area of interest because it's so, um, it's so tied into our carbon story. Uh, and many of you may know about this, but if you, if you don't, I encourage you to look at it more carefully. You know, it's the single biggest land use in the world is for farming. Uh, urban planners have been focused on the city, the kind of built environment, but we're not, we're ignoring what is the largest and probably most important, uh, at least to the planetary health, uh, part of our landscape, which is the unbuilt areas. Uh, so how can we be um, apply our, our skills as designers to this kind of, you know, the natural ecosystem? And I don't know the answer, but I think that's, that's what you're going to go figure out, right? Question here. We have the technology to know exactly where the sun is going to be every minute of the day, every day of the year. It sounds like you're utilizing that. You're, utilize, you're utilizing technology, you're utilizing computer to do calculations that would take us longer than I can imagine. Um, architects didn't do that, people didn't do that decades ago. 
Yeah, I, th I think, um, I mean, I'll, I'll try this. I think you probably inherently have a high degree of, um, a high, high degree of digital skills just because of your generation and the exposure that you have to digital tools uh, in your school and the way that, you know, they just permeate our lives, right? We rely on them, um, I think, to a greater degree than we ever expected to. Uh, so that's an important part, but I assume that will be second nature uh, to what you're doing. All of the technology that we have to, that we, we use to do our analyses is available on the internet. You know, so you can go and get that same data. You may need to learn how to, you do need to learn how to, to use it. But I think the tools will be there and they're getting easier to use. Um, I think you need to know what you stand for, uh, what's important to you. Uh, it's not all about saving energy and um, you know, the daylight levels in, in your space. These are important things that buildings do, but you need to um, decide what's right you know, for, for you and what's important in, in architecture. So a strong value system, because I think um, through uh, we're bombarded with media in a way that we've never been bombarded with media. So your your kind of inner, your moral compass, your gyroscope is is constantly challenged to to in, and pulled in different directions. Uh, so I was talking with Scott before coming down here. Pay attention in your history classes. Pay attention in your theory classes. Um, you know, look outside of. Uh, just the craft of architecture. It's very important, but um, the future will be about collaboration and drawing on uh, culture and drawing on politics. And I didn't really get into politics tonight, but you can probably tell where I'm at. Um, so, uh, you know, th those don't, don't be blinded by, let's say, the um, technological positivist point of view, that early modernist po point of view that technology can kind of solve everything. Question? Yeah, um, that's an excellent question. Frankly, one I've never, I've never thought of. Uh, but I, I do think it's important to go beyond the modernist visual connection with outside. You know, we we could make big pieces of glass that allowed us to see out and and be connected with nature, but it was in a very limited way. And I think what you know we hope to push in the work that we're doing is is a much more layered understanding of interface with the environment. I'll give you an example. Um, we just did a competition for a building in Sydney uh, where we located a goat farm within the office building. And um, it sounded outrageous. The jury laughed a little bit, but it's going to happen. Uh, we need to have more engagement between uh, ecosystems and maybe the goat farm is a little radical, but, you know, everyone likes, uh, you know, goat cheese omelets and, uh, you know, why not, right? It'd be great to go down to your cafeteria here and have, um, you know, eggs that came from chicken outside. I don't want to talk about vegetarianism or anything, but the point is more that uh, it should be a layered approach to, to transparency. Question? Yeah, and, and this is why I think the Jenks diagram is important. There are all these ideas that are kind of swirling out there. And, um, you know, even, even Mies was building on those people that came before him. He was taking, uh, you know, uh, sort of cross-pollinating with other, other disciplines. So not only are there architects, but um, 
but people outside of the realm of architecture, non-designers, people, like what is Elon Musk doing, right? He's develop, he's the one developing the sustainable city. How can this guy who does cars and batteries suddenly be an urbanist, you know? So I think that you're gonna see more of that in the future. You've seen the emergence of landscape ar architecture as a, um, a landscape urbanism, I'm sorry, as a discipline. Uh, this has, you know, this is a radical transformation where people are thinking about how to design ecosystems in balance with cities. Uh, and we're involved with that very much. Um, but it's, it's definitely part of a larger set of impulses out there. Question? Yeah, ideally it would be all of it. And you know, your, your, your question was about, I think the degree of uh, engagement that we have, I think it's not enough. I think we need to um, continue with strategic alliances, collaborations with academia, uh, with you guys, with Oak Ridge. You know, we're working closely with an energy lab to try to get to the bottom of some of these um, problems, which you know, I, I see as critical in sort of the existential crisis of our time. I have 10-year-old twins. I want to you know, leave the planet in a healthier place for them. Uh, and we can't do it um, you know, just staying within the four walls so, uh, of our design studio or whatever. We have to get out, outside. Um, and, and I think academia wants the same thing. I think industry wants the same thing. So it's a really exciting time to be kind of graduating because you're coming into this um, emerging hybrid of the public and the private or you know, private practice, uh, public interest, and probably private capital driving some of it, which is terrifying, but probably an inevitability uh, for, the, for, for the short term. Um, and, and like, let's leverage it. You know, that's what we're trying to do. Let's, uh, let's engage with industry as much as we can um, because we can't develop that expertise within our, again, within our four walls on our own as quickly as we can with others. Question? When you look back and you see those early SOM projects and you say, you know, they're, they look normative now, but they were radical then. What's radical now? I don't know. Uh, I mean, um, is that a, I, I think it's an interesting formula, kind of uh, formalization in a way. So I just yeah. wonder, like today, where do we look for, I don't mean what's radical in SOM, I mean what's radical, how do we see the ruptures today that, we, that, that we're going to look back on and say, okay, that started <clears throat> Yeah, I didn't, maybe those days are past. I mean, as, I, as I've said, we're saturated with, uh, with imagery uh, of, of buildings. Starchitecture changed everything. Gary's building changed everything. The propagandistic value of architecture has reached a degree that it's never had before. You know, um, and you all consume buildings online at a pace that I never could. We used to buy books, right? It was very quaint. You know, you would get the next El Croquis or whatever, small, medium, large, extra large, and it was like eye-opening. Now you um, have completely uh, unlimited access to the avant-garde, let's say. And Scott and I were talking about this a little bit before. I think, you know, the, the avant-garde or, you know, radical thought had um, uh, I think a more definition in the past. In the, in the recent past, we've refocused, and it's a little bit of a pendulum game, uh, but we've refocused on solutions to real problems. 
uh, I think you see, I see that in the design studios, um, whether that's engaging with technology or solving ecological problems or, or so on. Um, in part because there was so much fascination with, um, with theory. Uh, when I was being educated, I was sort of at that hinge moment between theory and, um, and a more uh, kind of practical or applied approach. Uh, so the, the avant-garde sort of lies among us. You know, it's, it's here and um, anybody can do it as well. I think, you know, with the tools that are available, uh, fewer and fewer people are required to make um, a building and make a statement that everyone sees. So with that comes a saturation um, that I think we need to be mindful of. And that's why I can't really answer the question. Um, I, th I think probably uh, technology will be a driver for um, the next paradigm shifting buildings, but it's hard to predict what that will be. And it's harder to point to one person and say he, she did it. You know, it's, it's an inherently collaborative enterprise. I mean, I think it's here. I think we use it <clears throat> as a tool. For a long time, when the tools became available, we were using them to solve problems that we created ourselves. Like, and I, by we, I'm not just saying my firm or practice. I'm saying we as an architectural uh, set of practitioners. Our, our curves were too complex, and we couldn't figure out how to build them, so we needed to write a script to rationalize the surface that would then suddenly be, we were heroes coming out of that, right? We figured out how to build that thing. And then, um, but now I think there's, there's kind of a greater degree of um, using the tools to develop optimal solutions, whether that's materially, uh, you know, some of the research that you all are doing here uh, and elsewhere, you know, in, in academia, uh, you see a lot of examples of that. Um, and I, I would say that the next paradigm shift, if I'm going to predict, would be in the way that projects are de delivered. So building information modeling has permeated uh, practice. We now do all of our projects in uh, a building information model. Uh, and it's, we see it as, as a means to an end, but not an end in itself. But what happens next is that model becomes a, uh, a, a real building on the site, right, in a very direct way. Uh, and that, has, that sort of promise has not been realized yet. You see sort of glimmers of it happening here and there, you know, small scale projects. But when, when that happens and you get that complete vertical integration from the design concept through to the realization, uh, it will radically transform our field. Uh, and maybe anyone can be an architect, right? That's, that's the terrifying thing as well. You kind of don't want that, or I don't know if we do. Uh, Okay, thanks.